On this episode of Cape Media News, a community mourns the loss of Barnstable Police Department's veteran officer, Sergeant Jason Sturgis. The Atlantic White Shark Conservancy kicks off its new Shark Smart Beach Safety Program, and we test pond water for cyanobacteria with the Association to Preserve Cape Cod. These stories and more, this is Cape Media News. You're watching Cape Media News, your local authentic newscast for Cape Cod. I'm Gabrielle Rawson. Thank you so much for joining us. Cape Cod is mourning the death of Barnstable Police Sergeant Jason Sturgis, an officer who dedicated his life to the community and worked to address homelessness on Cape Cod. Sergeant Sturgis unexpectedly passed away Saturday, July 6th. A public procession was held Wednesday. A 19-year veteran of the Barnstable Police Department, Sergeant Jason Sturgis, was escorted home from Boston to Cape Cod, Wednesday, July 10th. The public processional was met by many supporters as it made its way from Boston to Cape Cod and along West Main Street. Sergeant Sturgis will be remembered for his work in the community. A memorial service is planned for Tuesday, July 16th at Barnstable High School. Sergeant Jason Sturgis leaves behind a wife and three young children. In response to the community's outpouring of support, the Barnstable Police Association is accepting donations for his family. An increase in toxic algae blooms at several local ponds are causing concern for local residents and conservationists. Although naturally occurring, cyanobacteria has been known to produce toxins that pose health risks to animals and humans. In partnership with scientists from the University of New Hampshire, Brewster Ponds Coalition, and Friends of Chatham Waterways, the Association to Preserve Cape Cod has developed a cyanobacteria monitoring program. We followed them to the north shore of Scargo Lake and Dennis to learn more. Emily Tullock reports. Toxic algae blooms are prompting advisories across Cape Cod. Cyanobacteria, a microscopic phytoplankton that lives in ponds, has been found in Dennis, Barnstable, and Brewster. We met with Brian Horsley of the Association to Preserve Cape Cod, where he was testing the water to learn more. Um, so what we're seeing is that with climate change, with our surface waters warming up, uh, and with more nutrients entering the waters, we're seeing cyanobacteria grow uh, more quickly into higher densities, and that's when we have these harmful blooms occurring. Uh, and when we have harmful blooms occurring, that's when toxins can be released into the water that are concerning for people and pets and wildlife. The cyanobacteria has harmful effects on wildlife, including people and pets who come in contact with it. Yeah, so the, when a harmful bloom occurs, um, it's not a good thing for the pond itself, so it blocks out light and it can result in lower oxygen concentrations in the pond, which can be harmful to all the organisms that live in the pond. So you can ha end up with fish kills or freshwater mussel die-offs and things like that. Um, as far as pet and human exposure, the main concern is the toxins that the cyanobacteria release. Um, so um, humans or pets could be exposed to those um, by just actually aerosols off of the surface of the water, um, direct skin, skin contact with the water actually, and then the most concerning of course would be actually drinking or consuming the water. So, yeah, so the more serious health effects of you know, cyanotoxin exposure could be liver failure or um, there have actually been links to ALS and Alzheimer's disease with more long-term chronic type of exposure. Horsley says the Association to Preserve Cape Cod's Citizen Program encourages volunteers to gather samples. Yeah, so we, we actually learned about this program and, and are following a monitoring and sampling methodology that was developed by the Cyanobacteria Monitoring Collaborative. Uh, so they're a, a group of New England states, um, involves the U.S. EPA, um, and then various other groups. Uh, and they produce this citizen science level monitoring um, methodology that is, you know, basically you don't need science, scientists, you don't need an actual laboratory to do it. It's something that, you know, you could actually do on your home, you know, by on your home countertop if you wanted to, if you wanted to invest in the equipment. Yeah, anybody who's interested and, in, you know, it's very simple. You come out, put on some rubber boots and cast out a plankton net, uh, grab a sample with a bottle and then bring it over and drop it off at our lab. 
Um, and we even have people helping us with some of the microscopy, looking in the microscope and identifying the different types. We followed Horsley to the lab to observe the testing process. Okay, so as we start in a lower magnification and then just take a first look and see what's in there. So I can see right away there's a lot of microcystis, which is one of the most common toxin-producing cyanobacteria that we have. And, you know, one important thing to, to keep in mind, though, is that they are naturally existing and mm -hmm. uh, they should be there. You know, they, okay. they're, they're a natural part of the pond ecosystem, so just having them is not a concern. We, you know, we would expect them to be just about everywhere. It's the fact that it's, or the problem arises when they grow in you know, excessive abundance. Horsley says, Local vets are monitoring the impact of cyanobacteria on the pet population. Dogs are kind of the canary in the coal mine, you know, to be honest with this, because they're the ones that are there lapping up the scum on the shoreline more often than people. Veterinarians are starting to see more occurrences. Um, my sense is that it's generally more like itching and stuff like that, uh, you know, typical dog stuff. Um, but certainly, you know, I would imagine stomach issues and things like that. And then, of course, you know, horrible but neurological issues, you know. So what can you do to prevent more algae blooms from occurring? Things like uh, reducing um, fertilizer usage on your lawns um, and... Um, you know, thinking about our uh, wastewater situation, so perhaps looking at alternative septics and composting toilets and different things like that where we can, you know, sort of keep the nutrients from getting in the environment. Um, so people often ask about what can we do to fix the pond, and that's always my answer is deal with the source of the problem first. For a cyanobacteria monitoring map, ways to get involved, and to learn more about the Association to Preserve Cape Cod, visit their website, apcc.org. In Dennis, for Cape Media News, I'm Emily Tellick. The Association to Preserve Cape Cod has tested more than 20 ponds this year and plans to expand their testing in the coming months. In the meantime, they're urging people to report any water that looks brown or murky to town officials. Up next, grab your peanuts and Cracker Jacks. It's baseball season on Cape Cod. The Cape Cod Baseball League began its 134th season this summer, and Cape Media News is continuing its tradition of taking you behind the scenes. Cape Cod Baseball League is in full swing. We visited White House Field in Harwich to speak with some of the Harwich Mariners and the staff about today's game and their thoughts on the season so far. I'm Carson Seymour. I'm from Kansas State University. I'm Chris. I'm from Stoneham, Massachusetts, uh, and I play left field. I'm um, also Chris, uh, I'm from Southern Massachusetts and I also play left field. We asked the players how the Cape League helps them improve their game and what they need to do to focus on getting a win. Uh, you got a lot of uh, talented guys that uh, have worked hard to get to uh, this point for them and I think that uh, a lot of these guys understand how to make themselves better players and what makes it special is they can help other great players become even better. It's kind of just bouncing off ideas about swings like what you feel in your swing and other little things that can make you a better player. Better at defense, get better at base running, and um, I mean just better my game as a whole. Um, yeah, I definitely want to uh, every day just get a little bit better, um, do little things in uh, BP, uh, shagging balls in the outfield, just uh, every day just try to get better. Just play hard. Um, both teams have a lot of talent on, on their squad, so I mean whoever plays harder, whoever uh, gets the bounces is gonna gonna take this one home. The well, last time we played Chatham they were pretty good hitters, so that's as a pitching standpoint I feel like they're, we're going to have to attack them with everything we got. They, they hit the ball well, so I'm looking for, forward to seeing a lot of hits and hard contact. My goal is just velo-wise. Uh, I've hit some good velocities with my fastball. I feel like I've been developing my curveball well, and overall I feel good. We also spoke with Coach Stephen Engler about his time with the Mariners and what he's looking to get out of the season going forward. In the past, even the guys that didn't even get into the bigs are just uh... You know, I've been super kids. Obviously, you had Ian Happ, Brandon Belt, and 
Uh, Jeff Neiman's back with us as a coach. Pitched down here for us in 03 and 04, and now he's, you know, after his uh, big league tenure, he's down here with us and, and uh, throwing his knowledge out there with our pitching staff, which is great. And, uh, you know, we've had a lot, of, a lot of good kids come through this organization, and uh, that's why we, we recruit. We try to get a, a quality kid. Just try to get the players better and send them back to school, you know, improved. Uh, trying to showcase their talent, obviously. Try to increase their draft stock for next year and hopefully win a few games along the way. In addition to helping players further develop their baseball skills, the Mariners organization also jumpstarts the careers of its interns. Uh, my name is Alex Weiner. I'm from Los Angeles and I go to school at Arizona State as a sports journalism major. I'm a media intern with the Harwich Mariners, so I was actually hired just to write and I showed up here and they told me, you know, they asked me if I had a camera, so I'm taking photos for the team as well. I'm running the Instagram, doing some things on Twitter, and uh, making graphics, so I'm kind of all over the place. The opportunities to get closer to the players, sort of, because, you know, you can kind of walk up after a game, grab a couple of them, get to know them a little bit better, and that close connections really help with what I do and really help in getting story ideas and really help in getting better pictures that I can get out to them. Um, I know they're always asking me for links to Flickr that I post all the pictures on. So, you know, it's just a really cool opportunity to get up close and personal with some of the best that are going to be, you know, potentially professional baseball players eventually. No, I appreciate everybody's support here. I mean, the, the housing families down here make this, make this whole league go. And, and they're tremendous individuals. And, and uh, our organization, I'm blessed. Uh, from Mary Henderson on down, her, her son-in-law uh, Ben, our general manager Biz, and Bill Marquardt is our uh, he's a fundraiser, and all the people that help us out in the concession stand and do all these things. I, I mean, it, I can't say it enough how thankful I am of them and appreciative, and I don't say it enough. The final score was three to two, with Chatham winning. In Harwich for Cape Media News, I'm Tyler Allen. To learn more about the Cape Cod Baseball League or to find a game near you, visit capecodbaseball.org. Spending time in nature has long been considered one of the best ways to reduce stress and improve well-being. But did you know some studies now show it can also support healing? The town of Dennis is investigating this possibility and seeking public comment on a proposed design that would turn a stretch of conservation land along Route 134 into a therapeutic walking path. The Independence Pathway Project was presented last month at the Senior Center in Dennis. Cape Media News reports. Having limited mobility doesn't have to mean that your walking days are behind you. Now that the Town of Dennis Council on Aging and Department of Natural Resources has proposed a new walking trail on Setucket Road and Route 134 in Dennis. We're here to present some concepts, concept plans and designs for the Independence Trail and it's a trail that would be a physical therapy trail um, geared, geared towards the seniors, but also for all ages. It is probably the only uh, physical therapy park uh, or trail that is going to incorporate a number of clusters and areas, uh, creating the least disturbance to that environment, but allowing folks to use it for physical therapy purposes. The Independence Pathway would promote the use of conservation land to support the health and well-being of residents who are in rehabilitation after a fall or those living with mobility challenges and cognitive impairment. We have a growing aging population in Dennis. It's a very active population. Uh, they like to walk and walk and talk is one of our clubs. We have um, all types of exercise classes and groups that love to be active and engaged. And so we couldn't think of a better location between the senior center and between senior housing to create a, a physical therapy walkway. There'll be some um, uh, exercise equipment, um, just various things to use, but it really is geared towards um, the people that live in this area, around the area, the community, um, being so close to the senior center and to senior housing. If approved, the pathway will be ADA compliant and be designed to help walkers improve balance, strength, and flexibility. Fully ADA compliant, that's very important. There'll also be um, some ADA parking spaces. There'll be a few parking spaces, not a lot, because of course the land isn't too large, um, but there will be parking at the senior center, and there would be a possibility for some, um, you know, maybe a golf cart or something to shuttle people over if, if there's a group that wants to come over. 
The project is funded through a grant from the Dennis Community Preservation Committee and was approved by voters at the October 2017 special town meeting. You know, there's an aging population and I deal with a lot of older people that are used to walking in the woods and walking on conservation lands and unfortunately most of them are not accessible to people with mobility issues. So we started looking at conservation areas that we might be able to put simply a handicapped accessible trail, you know, wide enough for a wheelchair, compacted, you know, sediment, et cetera. And then I reached out to the, the Council on Aging and we started saying, well, what about the piece across the street? You know, it's perfect. It's near senior housing, it's near Council on Aging. And we kind of just got the ball rolling, you know, and we talked to people like my son who had an injury and other people, people with autistic children, et cetera. And we approached the um, community preservation group for some funding to see if we could at least develop a design. The proposed walkway would be built with environmentally friendly building materials and include a wheelchair ramp and educational signage. When we first learned about the project, that our client, the town of Dennis, um, that was actually one of their requirements, was that we really respect nature and that we um, you know, try to use a, a lot of um, the natural elements um, in the design down to, um, rather than bringing in some kind of a, a exercise equipment from a catalog, that we maybe think about how that could be constructed from logs from um, boulders that may be excavated from the site, that sort of thing. The town of Dennis has invited the public to view the proposed design and provide feedback. We really want to hear what the community has to say because what we're thinking, um, we think we're geared towards what they're thinking because we've done some research and, and, uh, and this did come from the um, open space plan survey that people really have the need. They want more outdoor activities and more places to walk. So we think we're good there, but there might be something we're missing or not thinking of. Uh, maybe it's too much, maybe it's too little. Um, so we really want to hear the comments, both good and bad. <laughs> Of course, it's all in a conceptual stage right now. We just had our first public comments on this, and so I'm sure that you'll be hearing more about it. And of course, come to the Senior Center. We have information here, we have the displays, and we're always happy to answer any questions you have. For more information about the Independence Pathway Project, visit the Dennis Senior Center or visit them online. In Dennis, for Cape Media News, I'm Gabrielle Rawson. You can view the Independence Pathway's proposed design and leave feedback at the Dennis Senior Center on Route 134 in South Dennis. Up next, we visit the Shark Center in Chatham to learn about the Shark Smart Beach Safety Program. We are requesting assistance in surveillance for a tick that potentially could be here on Cape Cod, Asian Longhorn Tick. It was found originally on a sheep farm in New Jersey in 2017. Then it was found on another sheep farm in another county in 2018. There have been subsequent findings in states adjacent to New Jersey. I suspect that it's being moved through the interstate movement of livestock. In the summer of 2019, it was found in Connecticut, so it's on our doorstep. We're asking people who own animals like sheep, horses, goats, and alpacas to inspect their animals, particularly if you've acquired animals from out of state. No diseases have been associated with this tick as yet, but it has the potential to cause a very large tick load on the animal that could affect its health. Asian longhorn ticks are rusty, reddish brown, with no distinct markings. If you happen to find ticks meeting this description, please contact me. Thank you. Welcome back to Cape Media News. I'm Gabrielle Rawson. The return of summer means the return of white sharks, and 2019 has been no exception. With reported sightings along Cape Cod's coast and now Cape Cod Bay, safety is on everyone's mind. I met with the Atlantic White Shark Conservancy's Education Director to learn more about their new Shark Smart Beach Safety Program in Chatham. Cape Cod has always been a popular beach destination, but now it's known for something else, white sharks. The Atlantic White Shark Conservancy has been studying them for years off our coastline, and now they want to share that information with the public. Their new Shark Smart Beach program kicked off earlier this month at Lighthouse Beach. We visited the Shark Center in North Chatham 
to learn more. We really want to try to connect the public with what's going on here with White Shocks off our coastline and really introduce them to the opportunity we have to learn more about this animal and have a positive impact in conservation. As we go into this summer, we are excited to offer a new program and that is the Shark Smart Beach Safety Program that's going to take place up at Chatham Lighthouse Beach. Um, and so every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday morning at 9 a.m., a representative from the Conservancy will be up there on the bluff and they'll be ready to give a short presentation with an update on what is going on with white shark research. So it's a really exciting time with the research kicking off and we want to share, as we're learning information, that information with the public so they are up to date with what we're learning. Um, so they'll share some of that. They'll also be talking about some of the safety initiatives and really being there to answer people's questions. Um, we have learned that the news is a great source and sharks are interesting, but the news does have their limits and how much they can share with that time break. And so it often leaves people wanting to know more. And so this is just a different opportunity for families to come and learn more, as well as take in the beautiful Cape Cod environment right there at Lighthouse Beach. In addition to the Shark Smart Beach program, the White Shark Conservancy has renovated its Shark Center. Through interactive exhibits, videos, displays, and virtual reality experiences, the Shark Center provides visitors with many different ways to learn about sharks. We're really excited because this past winter we've been working on an expansion in the facility. Um, so we are going to be able to increase our capacity and engage even more people um, in you know, what is going on with white shark research as well as deliver that public safety messaging to even more visitors to this area, which is really important. With shark sightings on the rise, there is a growth demand for information. We have been really fortunate that every year since we've been open we've actually seen an increase in visitors by about 3,000 people a year and so this opportunity to expand within the building will allow us to engage that many more people over the course of the season as well as during the off season offer different programs for youth groups so we'll be able to increase and add more programming throughout the school year um, for local students as well as students from afar as well as some specialty programs that anyone can register for. The Atlantic White Shark Conservancy will continue to share its research with local officials and beach managers so they can improve and update their public safety strategies. If you want to learn more about white sharks, you can visit the newly renovated Shark Center at 235 Orleans Road in North Chatham or attend the Shark Smart Beach Safety Program at Lighthouse Beach. Reporting for Cape Media News, I'm Gabrielle Rawson. To learn more about white sharks and beach safety, you can join the Atlantic White Shark Conservancy at Lighthouse Beach every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday through August. For more information, visit AtlanticWhiteShark.org. Well, that brings this week's episode of Cape Media News to a close. Please be sure to follow us on Facebook and thank you so much for watching. We'll be back next week with a brand new episode. For Cape Media News, I'm Gabrielle Rawson.